Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started here so that we can get you out in time for lunch. Uh, hope you, hopefully you guys all got some break food and some drink. Uh, my name is Arnold Sito from the Long Beach VA. I'm joined by Olga Toreva from, the, uh, from Emory, who needs to upload her slides. We have a great panel today with Chadi Aurelis and, uh, and Farouk Jaffer, as well as Manoj Kesawani and uh, Louis Cole from earlier this morning. So we'll just jump right into it. We're going to go over physiology and imaging uh, this session. So my slides are up above. Um, again, I'm at the Long Beach VA, Charles Drew University, and UC Irvine. And I have the honor of presenting the year in review in coronary physiology. It's supposed to be coronary physiology publications, but that's, of course, too limiting because publications are two years out of date. So we'll go over things that were presented at the major conferences. These are my disclosures. I have research grants and consultancies. Uh, so what I wanted to highlight were just mainly two major things, the five-year flare and IFR sweetheart uh, results, which were presented at EuroPCR, and then the angio angiographic FFR comparisons. Many of you are familiar with this paper that just came out in May. So we know about IFR and FFR. Many of us are using IFR in the non-hyperemic pressure ratios. As you recall, FFR is a hyperemic whole cycle uh, index that measures P distal over P aortic uh, during adenosine hyperemia, whereas the non-hyperemic pressure ratios like IFR take a diastolic uh, pressure ratio uh, without uh, the need for adenosine hyperemia. And as you recall, the Define Flare trial and the IFR Sweetheart trial were about 2,500 patient trials each, which compared uh, IFR-guided PCI with FFR-guided PCI. And they had a similar uh, design so that they could later be merged uh, in terms of the results. The IFR Sweetheart five-year trial uh, data came out uh, last year, and they showed that there was no difference in MACE or mortality across IFR or FFR, indicating that there's no difference in outcomes, and uh, it was considered an extension of what they found at one and two years, and what Defined Flare also found. But you can see there's a little bit of a, a deviation near the end, and it makes you wonder, well, is there a little bit of a signal there? But it was non-significant. So, for a defined flare, the, the trial that I participated in, those were presented by Javier Eskined just a few months ago at EuroPCR. And the primary uh, endpoint of MACE continued to show no significant difference, although it was maybe a slight trend towards increased MACE with the use of IFR-guided PCI, which is a little disturbing. Uh, but still, non-significant could be a signal error. Uh, but when you dive down into the question of, what, you know, is there a mortality difference? Well, then you're dealing with smaller numbers, and that's where certain things can show up. So uh, the five-year results indicated that there was a difference in all-cause mortality where IFR was inferior to FFR-guided PCI. And when you divide this up, it was uh, divided up equally into uh, non-cardiovascular and cardiovascular causes, and then confirmed cardiovascular causes and unknown were about the same. Diving down even deeper, uh, one could have th thought that, well, you know, IFR is associated with less in revascularization compared with FFR. On average, you do 10% fewer PCIs with IFR. Uh, so maybe we were missing some lesions. Well, that turned out not to be the case. If you have a signal of MACE, additional MACE seemed to occur in those patients that actually got stented, not the people who were, were not stented. So that's kind of confusing. We couldn't really tell why is there a difference in MACE amongst the people that were stented. So it remained a little bit, it still remains a little bit unexplained. Why is there an increase in uh, MACE in the population that were, were revascularized by IFR? Diving down even further, if you break this down, this, this is really granular at this point. The reported causes of cardiovascular death included sudden cardiac death, MI, heart failure, and stroke, and there was a, an increase in death with IFR. And so the summary of this is that at five years, IFR remains non-inferior to FFR in terms of unplanned revascularization, non-fatal MI, and statistically speaking, to, for MACE. But when you combine the two trials, uh, Define Flare and IFR Sweetheart, there was a signal of excess mortality from both trials with a hazard ratio of 34% more, p-value of 0.01. And this is despite IFR typically being associated with 10% PCI than FFR. So any excess MACE signal occurred again in the revascularized population. Uh, some, you know, the authors, including myself, you know, some of this could be a play of chance. Um, an excess a number of deaths, you know, we, we talk about the, fr uh, the fragility index of this, t of this trial, how fragile are the results. If you just moved eight patients from mortality to the, uh, to the other side, that would suffice to make this mortality signal non-significant. And I can tell you that as a Divine Flare investigator, they investigated every, they, they chased down every patient. And of course, they chased down one of my patients that was lost to follow-up, and it turned out to be a mortality on the IFR side. So had they not been so diligent, they would have maybe, maybe made this non-significant. Uh, regardless, you know, because there's no explanation for this, MACE is still, uh, is still equivalent. Uh, Non-hyperemic pressure ratios still seem to be re reasonable for a physiologic assessment. When you think about this, how is this possible? How amongst the patients that we revascularize would IFR-guided PCI be worse? 
And the only potential explanation is that maybe, just maybe, again, totally speculating, maybe IFR is directing us towards treating things that we shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't be treating diffuse disease. We know that IFR is more likely than FFR to be positive in diffuse disease rather than focal lesions. Focal lesions are more likely to be FFR positive, IFR negative, because of the separation coefficient. It's exponential, and when you give hyperemia, that exponential effect affects FFR more than IFR. So if there's any explanation for this at all, which, again, I, I, you know, the authors and myself would lean towards this being a play of chance, but if there is any explanation, maybe we shouldn't be treating diffuse lesions. That's something you can figure out from an IFR pullback. It's something that you can figure out from angiography. So I would submit that you can still use IFR in non hyperbaric pressure ratios. Just keep an eye on the angiograms. Don't try to treat lesions that you really shouldn't. Treat lesions that are focal because that's what PCI is for. That's my message. Okay, so moving on, what else is going on in physiology? Well, they're continuing to innovate, uh, and this will go, will, Bill Fearon will give another talk on Saturday about future of physiology, but uh, they are working on the, the ray cath catheter uh, the hexa, by Hexaflow, and that's hopefully coming to the US, a continuous flow uh, measure of CFR and FFR. Uh, and so they have some new indices. This is a modification of that, where you can use a controlled continuous infusion, where you can actually get a, you know, some novel pressure parameters. So these are still in experimental phase, but uh, you, you can use a con continuous flow catheter to measure FFR and IFR and, and other ratios. What about CT FFR? Well, CT FFR by heart flow is a great technology that's now approved by the FDA and we reimbursed by CMS, but it takes hours. You send it to heart flow, they send it back the next day. Now the Chinese have come up with this on-site CT FFR with machine learning, and it seems to be just as good at avoiding re, uh, uh, angiography, uh, unnecessary angiography and the like. So potential replacement for heart flow. But I wanted to focus next on the angiography-derived FFR. Cath works, uh, QFR, that's the biggest thing in the literature. How many of you have access to angiographic FFR in your lab? Still new, right? Not reimbursed yet, so not surprising, right? But still, this is something that could revolutionize physiology because by a push of a button, theoretically, you could have the results uh, of a three-vessel, th whole-vessel assessment of where the lesions are and which lesions are significant. So the meta-analyses in the past have suggested that there's a good R value of 0.81 and AUC of about 0.9 for all the IFR, all the not, uh, all the sorry, angiographic FFR, CathWorks, QFR. They're all supposedly quite good, and all of them have gotten validation studies against FFR, which have suggested the same thing. AUC is about 9, 0.92, 0.94 very good correlation with FFR. Therefore, these got you know you know CathWorks got approved, and and they all have CE mark. Uh, QFR has the most, uh, most publications, and they actually have the most clinical studies, uh, even though market, from a market standpoint, they're behind in the US. But regardless, QFR seems to have good um, clinical studies where Favored 3 China recently showed at two years that, quantity, that QFR guided PCI was better than angiography. So this is like a, a FAME-like trial. They showed exactly what FAME showed, that physiology guided PCI is better than angio guided PCI. It's kind of a low bar in this day and age, but it's, it's still pretty good, right? So this is just as good as FAME with more patients. So it does have a role. But many of you are familiar with this paper that was published in May of, in, in Jack Interventions 2023, where they actually took these all, uh, a number of these angiographic FFR systems. Five different systems were tested. QFR from Medis, VFFR from Pi Medical, Rain Med, CA FFR, Micro FFR from Pulse Medical, one projection, and also a two projection, Micro FFR. Interestingly, CathWorks was not in, uh, included in this study, but what they did was they got four trained analysts. Each of them were trained in one of these uh, um, softwares, and the uh, matching investigator gave them the same angiographic view, which was optimized for each of these, uh, for, you know, optimized for all the angiographic FFRs, had the best separation, best angles, optimal frame was identified, and the site of measurement by the pressure wire was also noted. And what they found was somewhat surprising in contrast to all the validation studies, which showed, again, an R value of you know, 0.8 and AUCs of 0.9. Here you have R values of 0.37, 0.44, 0 0.5 at best, and your AUC was down to 0.73. So all of these angiographic FFR systems matched, uh, were equally good or equally bad, depending on your perspective. They're better than, 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 they're better than uh, diagnostic angiography or QCA. They're still better, they, they give you some value. But they're not nearly what was purported in the publication, the, the validations. So what's going on here? I mean. Were all these publications falsified? You know, 
highly unlikely? Were they selected? Was there something in the criteria of the selection of the patients or the, the angiograms that made them easier? Was there any kind of contamination? All we know is that all the, all the public, all, they all uh, participated in this study. This was a blinded study. And so it raises some question about how accurate this angiographic FFR is. It, again, it'll still be better than, di than, than, than uh, diagnostic angiography, but there's still some, uh, some question as to how valuable it is. In my personal experience, it, it, does, it does get thrown off quite a bit. There's a lot of operator, uh, operator error and training of the, train, of the, of the uh, technician. Uh, one of my technicians had it in his private lab, and he said, oh, it's kind of like dial a defect. You can still do, you know, dial, you know, draw in which lesion you want. And so it raises some question as to the uh, fidelity of this system. Uh, angiographic FFR still is not reimbursed completely. There is a T code, which gives you some reimbursement for the operator, but there's no uh, reimbursement yet for the hospital. The T code, interestingly, pays you more as an operator than it does than the, uh, than the FFR does. FFR only pays you $73. In certain localities, you can get up to $150, $160 just from pushing a button. So if you're the physician, you're making money. If you're the hospital, you might be losing a little bit of money. So in summary, angiographic FFR is here and works most of the time, but bad data leads to bad results. Training, is, processing of images is critical. It's unclear how the reimbursement will develop over time. Uh, CathWorks withdrew their application for AMA uh, CPT uh, for one year because they wanted to get more of a market so that AMA will actually justify a, C a new CPT code. Uh, optimal angiographic views and angles are critical, so you should have 10-inch views and no panning. Um, and so what I've shown you today is that we have some you know, tempering data, something that should temper your enthusiasm about angiographic FFR, and to some extent, temper your enthusiasm for non-hyperemic pressure ratios. And they're, not, they're not out the window, but there are some questions about it. So how you look at that depends on your point of view. I can't resist showing this slide, that, which is from Clathworks. This looks really bad from one angle, but it could look really good in another angle. Thank you very much. Uh, well, go. I guess we'll, uh, I'll start with a question. Uh, it, it actually looks very exciting to be able to do some non-invasive uh, evaluation and not always put wires into patients' arteries. However, um, as you pointed out, the technique and how we do angiogram is very important. So maybe one of the messages here is no panning, standard views are very important for the fellows in training who are learning this technique. Question. Um, now there are some developments uh, in CTFFR, uh, and uh, is there any comparison between the angiographic FFR and CTFFR and its applicability in clinical practice? There have been several publications on comparing QFR or CTFFR. Um, you know, they correlate. They correlate. You know, reasonably well in the publication, but it's not. Nothing's perfect. I mean, Dr. Kern had this rule of 80% that everything correlates by 80%. Well, it looks like these are slightly less than 80%, but um, but they still correlate better than nothing. Uh, great, thanks, Arnold, for enlightening us, us as always um, on the state of the art in physiology. Um, on the first um, trial you presented, the five-year results on IFR sweetheart, really fascinating. Uh, two comments. One is. Uh, a question is, you know, even in the deferred arm, there's a 17% MACE rate at five years, and the curves are continuing to grow. And so I think, you know, we kind of, um, as a field, haven't really embraced this concept that we need to look at people's long-term time horizons. Five years is great for a clinical trial, but, you know, our patients are going to be living for decades. So you can extrapolate this in 10 years to maybe be 30%. So one out of three might actually have an event, um, even though they had a great result at time zero. So what is your thought about like really understanding, you know, the role of imaging and, and kind of further stratifying, um, for example, high-risk plaques? This is more of a vulnerable plaque question. Should we be doing more in our FFR, IFR negative patients at this time? Yeah, I think, uh, Farouk, you're setting yourself up because, of course, imaging is your forte. Um, I think you have, um, you know, we have great data now, increasingly so, that IVIS and imaging is superior to post-PCI physiology uh, for optimizing. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we had some data that suggested that they're equivalent, but, uh, I mean, nowadays, with the most recent data from IVIS, uh, we're suggesting that it's probably superior to physiology. 
I think you're, you're, you're totally right, though, taking the big picture. Everybody, you know, you saw those, those curves match. There's 17% MACE rates at five years for, for whether you use FFR or IFR. I mean, these patients are high risk. They are going to have something eventually happen to them. And the longer out you look, the more you'll have something. Um, but I think in terms of optimizing, I think, yes, definitely uh, imaging is going to be superior for optimizing your outcome compared with physiology. Physiology is good for selecting the lesion, as we've always said. Optimizing the stent implantation is going to be with imaging at this point. Uh, if we have no other questions, um, I will... Uh... Uh, one, one last question. Uh, great presentation. Uh, congratulations. Uh, regarding the difference uh, between the IFR-guided uh, versus FFR-guided, the difference in outcomes, when I was reading the paper, I was, I was thinking that maybe the, the, the treatment with adenosine in the FFR group, because technically both groups had the same procedural characteristics, I was wondering if the, if the long-term outcomes was, uh, was because of the pretreatment with, a, with, uh, with adenosine. Because uh, in the acute MI and the vein graft intervention, we do have data that shows that pretreatment with adenosine improves outcomes. So that was a question I had. I did not see it in the discussion. So what do you think? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I've never thought about that. that you know, would pre-treating all of our elective PCIs with adenosine help with their long-term outcome, uh, as opposed to saying changing the the physiology afterwards? Um, I don't know that. I've never actually seen that. Um, I, you know, I don't think that there was a difference in this study. These were stable patients uh, with adenosine versus no adenosine, FFR versus IFR. I think that. It's an interesting concept. You'd have to think. We have to think through a mechanism for that. I, I don't have an answer. Uh, is in short. So, interesting idea. Okay, we'll proceed with the next presenter. Um, it's uh, Dr. Uh, Evan Schlafmitz uh, from St. Francis Hospital, who will present the ear in review in coronary and uh, intravascular imaging publications in five minutes. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. A little shift now to imaging, and I think it could be synergistic. It's not just an either or with physiology. So we'll go over just the key intravascular imaging publications from the last year. Let me get the, where do I have the point to get the slide advancing? There we go. All right. So the, la the sole landmark trial in intravascular imaging the past year was Renovate Complex PCI. So Renovate Complex PCI was presented at ACC, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what they were looking was to see the impact of intravascular imaging guided PCI compared to conventional angiographic guided PCI. It was a multi-center prospective randomized control trial took place in Korea. It was over 1,600 patients. And patients were randomized in a two-to-one fashion to either intravascular imaging with the modality at the operator's discretion, meaning you can use either IVIS or OCT, uh, and it was two-to-one to angiography. And the patient subgroup was patients with complex lesions. And what's interesting, when you look at the lesion types, complex lesions, it was all the usual suspects, left main, CTO, ISR, long lesions, calcified lesions, but they also included multivessel, multiple stents, and what was really novel, they included osteal lesions of a major epicardial vessel. So that's something that hasn't really been looked at systematically in the prior intravascular imaging studies as well. And the primary endpoint was a composite of MACE. So here was the key slide from the New England Journal paper, and you saw that at three years follow-up, there was significant benefit in reduction of MACE in patients treated with intravascular imaging compared with angio-guided PCI. Um, and what's important isn't so much just that big picture, because this just enhances what we've already seen in two other randomized trials, Ultimate and IVIS XBL. But here, with this different group of patients that were included, when they did the pre-specified subgroup analysis, there were a lot of novel findings that were here. So again, in the red, it's a little small to see here, but this study for the first time used OCT. And what they found, the benefit of intravascular imaging was actually driven in this study by the benefits seen in the patients who had OCT that was used. There also were some lesion subtype novel um, findings, patients with CTOs, long lesions, osteo lesions, all had significant benefit when treated with intravascular imaging. And then importantly, it's not just the lesion subtype, but it's actually the patient. 
In the subgroup analysis, they found that females, elderly patients, and patients with CKD all had substantial benefit when intravascular imaging was used. Now, I'll shift gears to a, a study that was just published this month, and it's a little more sobering. So this was an all-comer registry in France, the France PCI registry, and they looked at all patients treated with PCI in France and found that 7% of the PCIs there were for ISR. In the US, that's about 10%, so it's somewhat similar. They found that the majority of patients, three quarters of patients getting treated with ISR get another drug-eluting stent. And as expected all the way on the right, TLR is much worse if you have ISR that's being treated compared with de novo lesions. But really what was eye-opening to me, 1.9% intracoronary imaging in the real world in France for ISR. And there's no way to tell what the mechanism of instant restenosis is by an angiogram, yet in real world, we're not using imaging to the full extent that we should be. Another study that was published since the last CVI was the light lab data. So that was a study that took place multi-center looking at the impact of intravascular imaging on decision making for PCI. And what we found here was that when you ask a physician, what stent do you want to use? Are you going to use lesion preparation based on an angiogram? And then you do intravascular imaging, in this case OCT, 87% of the time you choose different equipment as a result of the intravascular imaging. And this really change in decision making and procedural strategy is what leads to those improved outcomes, I believe, and those randomized trials like renovate complex PCI. So nine out of 10 times, intravascular imaging changes the equipment you'll use in your strategy. And that's why I really think there's a lot to be said for using intravascular imaging as a standard of care in all PCIs. Another study that was just published was out of Michigan and the BMC squared group. And in this registry, they looked at the utilization of intracoronary imaging in all PCIs in the state of Michigan. It's all publicly reported. And what they found, 16% intravascular imaging in the state of Michigan. But what's interesting here is what were the predictors? When would intravascular imaging be used? And the biggest predictor was left main. That's expected. But the number two and three biggest predictor for when an IBIS or OCT catheter gets opened isn't the complexity of the lesion or the patient, it's who's doing the procedure and where the procedure is being done. The operator and the hospital is really what drove imaging utilization. And that means there's a lot that needs to change here. A patient shouldn't get a high quality or low quality procedure based on which cath lab they end up in. We need to make this a universal treatment option. It should be based on really the patient risk and the lesion risk that's really what's driving intravascular imaging. The good news out of the same registry, BMC squared, they looked at the growth of intravascular imaging, and you see in just a three-year period, intravascular imaging went from 7% to over 20% with just a couple of minor changes that led to, I believe, this increased utilization. The state of Michigan started public reporting. There's now public reporting in how much intracoronary imaging is being used at different hospitals and by different operators. Obviously, that led to increased utilization, and there's also reimbursement. When physicians get paid for what they're doing. That helped to drive utilization, and um, even more recent than this publication, that's now up to 33%. There were a couple of important consensus statements that came out over the past year, this one specifically on training. So the ACC Sky Societies put out a training standard statement that for the first time they included intravascular imaging. And they recommend that if you're graduating from interventional cardiology fellowship, it, you need to have a minimum of 25 IVIS or OCT procedures to graduate. But more important than that very low number and bar is you need to have skills to perform and interpret intracoronary imaging and physiology. Very important, you should not be graduating interventional cardiology without those basic skills. For everyone in this room who has fellows training with them, that's on you guys, it's not the fellow. We need to open up these imaging catheters and use it as part of our procedures if our fellows are gonna have any sort of competency in this when they graduate from fellowship. So it's a big advance that for the first time, there's minimum standards for interventional cardiology fellowship. Also recently, ACC and the Interventional Council put out a state-of-the-art review where they mandate that intravascular imaging should be available in every cath lab in the US, and ideally, both IVIS and OCT should be available 
that cath lab should have both of these modalities. And I think this is a really important statement because you hear all the time physicians saying that administration will not let me purchase an intravascular imaging system. There's not enough resources, there's not enough importance, and this is something that you can bring to your administrators if they're pushing back on you, saying that that's not a focus for our administration, that you're not meeting, your cath lab in hospitals not meeting the minimum standard set forth by the ACC for a contemporary cath lab. And I think and I hope that this will help to drive greater adoption of having at least the minimum equipment necessary to perform a high quality procedure. One last study, just a hypothesis generating one, looking at calcified nodules is a big focus of intravascular imaging. It's something you can adequately assess on an angiogram alone. There's two types of calcified nodules, eruptive and non-eruptive. And what we initially found from intravascular imaging, patients do great with the eruptive nodule. We get large expansion and we have a uniform stent expansion with that compared with a non-eruptive calcified nodule. But what was interesting in the study of over 200 patients with calcified nodules and serial imaging, the patients with eruptive nodules actually did much worse long term. I think it's hypothesis generating in an area where there needs to be a lot more research because we really don't know what the optimal treatment is for patients with calcified nodules. Now, those were the big studies that came out in the past year. Renovate Complex PCI was the only landmark intravascular imaging trial in the past year, but there's a lot of exciting studies coming out in the very near future. These are a list of all the intravascular imaging studies that either haven't been presented yet or are still ongoing. Most important, in the next month, the top two, um, Illumian 4 in October, are two large multi-center randomized control trials that are both being presented next month at ESC. Illumian 4 is a over 3,000 patient randomized control trial in complex lesions and complex patients looking at OCT compared to angio-guided PCI. October, over 1,000 patients that are being randomized to OCT versus conventional PCI in lesions with bifurcations. So we're going to have significantly more data on intravascular imaging just in the next month, and it's certainly an exciting year ahead with intravascular imaging. So with that, happy to take any questions. Great talk. Uh, thank you very much. I, I was found it very interesting that that recommendation from the ACC was for most labs to have both OCT and IVIS. Uh, how many of you have both OCT and IVIS in your lab? Okay, so actually a sizable minority, but still a minority. Uh, let me ask the panel, what do you guys think about that? Do we need OCT and IVIS in most labs? Yeah, I definitely think that uh, there's really compelling evidence, as you have presented, about intercoronary imaging being used routinely in a cath lab, and there's certain reasons or indications where we should think about IVIS versus OCT, to think about vessel diameter, whether the patient has renal dysfunction, and so I think having both is really important and useful um, just in those regards. Yeah, I'd, I would second that. I would love it if we had OCT in our lab. We have IVIS only, um, and that's okay. I think you can get by with rotational IVIS in some of the instances where you would use OCT, but I. The OCT platform is really powerful, and your ability to see is enhanced as compared to IVIS. Yeah, we, we have uh, both modalities, and we, we've been fortunate a couple of years ago we got an interventionist who, was, who, who led the, the use of OCT. When you use OCT in the majority of cases, you will use OCT rather than IVIS, but uh, I don't think it will replace completely. There are those cases that IVIS, especially for dynamic evaluation, that uh, it, it, we, I think we need to have both inter IVOS and OCT. I think one of the uh, even a great presentation is the limitation is for the operator and slow growth in Michigan, as you notice in the slide, is the education. They don't know what they're looking at, especially with the IVUS. Uh, starting with IVUS, we don't have OCT, but still we're struggling with IVUS. So now we are doing like a mini uh, workshops for people who are experts in imaging just to come and sit outside the lab and tell them like, this is basic stuff. Uh, not to be too pushy on them because some of them are like senior beyond the, what we're, the not, we're not part of their training, but also to emphasize that on the fellows and also the faculty that are not familiar with the process. And just to echo in this, uh, do you guys think that 25 uh, imaging procedures during the whole training is sufficient for a fellow to be facile with either technology? Because to, to echo on that, 
they mandate 200 PCIs to graduate interventional fellowship with 25 being imaging guided. So a 12% imaging rate. And you know, is that adequate? From, from, my expect, um, from, my, um, from my aspect, it's not enough. I mean, because I think you need to do as many as possible. And sometimes you need to image a lesion that you doesn't need a PCI. Sometimes if FIFR is a negative or you need to study or strategize your left main and send them for cabbage eventually. But I think 25 is, is just cr scratching the surface. Evan, thanks. Just to, just to add on this point, I think, um, I think we'd agree that any imaging is better than no imaging. Probably the, the low rate that's mandated in the guidelines is because we actually <clears throat> don't have enough senior investigators who are super comfortable doing imaging throughout the country. So the supervising attendings also have to get proficient and we have to have a mechanism to make that happen. And then I think we'll certainly increase our percentages of uh, image guided PCIs. Um, I just want to put it out there because I know you've thought about this is, you know, we have a dis ongoing discussions between IVIS and OCT and probably both are really essential. The OCT is so great for the surface when you're looking at mechanisms of ACS and ISR, um, but IVIS is really necessary for big vessels, total occlusion, subintimal spaces, things like that. What about the combination devices? Should we just be going to combined IVIS OCT systems? There are now two of them out there um, and they're likely to get better. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's a gr great question. There's a number of intravascular imaging catheters that are out on the market now. A lot have just been released in the past year. I think dual imaging modalities are a great tool, certainly for cath labs that maybe can only afford one system. So I think for a small center, that's a great option just to have that, because I think in the majority of cases, probably 70 to 80 percent of the time, you could use either IVIS or OCT. There is at least 20% of cases where one has a true advantage over the other and really helping to optimize the procedure. So I think for small labs, if you're gonna buy one, the dual imaging modality has a lot of appeal. With the current technology that's available, the dual imaging modality, I think, leaves out a lot of the bells and whistles that other imaging catheters have, which is why you know, my go-to catheters are either just an IVIS or OCT. But having said that, in Probably three to five percent of our cases at St. Francis, we use both an IVIS and OCT for that same case for exact reasons you mentioned. There's a lot of advantages with OCT in the near field, but for the osteal, if you're treating an osteal lesion, you may need IVIS to, um, to ensure you have an adequate result there. Evan, quick comment, um, you know, very elegant talk. And every time I hear you talk and you present such compelling data, you know, I'm like, we must be using this 100% of the times. And yet we see these very humbling numbers. And so a question to you and really to the whole panel is, um, wh wh why are these, uh, you know, barriers to imaging in the United States? And, you know, if you have any insights on that or anyone on the panel. You know, I don't understand why, truthfully. I really don't understand why. I could tell you what people bring up, and they cite a lot of myths. That it takes more time, takes more contrast, more radiation. It's not true. There's compelling data to show it actually speeds up your efficiency. We bring a patient to a cath lab to get the best result for the patient. We have now three large randomized controlled trials that took place in different countries that all show significant impact on patients at just two years, approaching 50% reduction in MACE. I don't understand the reason why. There has been a great adoption of radial access based on contemporary data. So, you know, people can adopt new equipment. What I suspect, it comes down to just an understanding of it. We surveyed graduating fellows um, at the CRF fellows course a couple of years back, and the month before graduation, we asked fellows how comfortable are you in IVIS, OCT, and FFR. So self-identified, do you feel comfortable doing this independently? So self-identified, if anything you think would, would be an enriched response, 7% felt comfortable in all three. It's unacceptable, and I think we, it's really, you know, we, we always blame the fellow, do more IVIS, do more IVIS. They don't get to always dictate what's used for the procedure. If you have fellows, we need to start using these modalities so our fellows can get adequate training and can use that in their um, practice. And I think the added benefit from that is your patients are gonna benefit from that as well. Uh, a question here. Uh, do, do you think that there'd be greater, greater penetration if there was a class one recommendation for routine use of intracoronary imaging? Is that the limitation? I think that'll certainly help. 
Um, I think it'll make it a lot harder for those cath labs and, and the administrators to say, no, we're not buying a system. Um, I think the guidelines leave some opportunity for um, expansion in, in the indications with intravascular imaging, but I think based on that, the final slide I showed with the data that's coming out over the next year, um, maybe we'll see some changes in the guidelines in the next iteration. This is sort of a follow-up question to your last excellent point, maybe for Arnold also. Do you worry that as we multiply our various imaging, both and physiology systems, both real and virtual, it's hard to get everyone, our trainees and ourselves, really proficient in virtual FFR, CathWorks, OCT, IVIS, IFR, FFR, if you consider that a separate modality. There's a lot of stuff out there now. You know, th there is, and it, it, it is overwhelming at the surface, but when you really deep dive into this, everything takes some, some knowledge to understand. You get a new iPhone, you have to figure out how to send an email. But once you embrace these technologies, and it's a relatively simple orientation, it actually makes the procedure a lot easier. I get nervous if I have to perform an angio-guided PCI, because I don't know what the right size stent is and where the landing zone is. I, I, don't, I don't think that an angio-luminogram is adequate to give you an optimal result. I'm not nervous when I have an intravascular imaging catheter because I have something telling me exactly how to do it. Um, the technology is getting better and better. We have AI that's telling us what size stent, where to land it, what's the plaque morphology. You have Ultrion, which integrates this, and it basically tells you how to do the whole procedure. So if you're graduating from fellowship, what's great for early career physicians, on day one, you have someone to bounce that idea off of. You can say, you know, I think this is pretty calcified because the software is lighting up and saying there's severe calcium there. So you have that reinforcement. I actually think it helps simplify this, and it helps make it that patients can get an equal opportunity result regardless of what cath lab. It shouldn't be what you saw at a Michigan. The physician shouldn't dictate what their outcomes are. Hopefully patients get an excellent opportunity to have a good outcome regardless which cath lab they're treated in, by which physician. And this helps to, I think, universally boost the, the quality of the PCI. I think one interesting thing, though, as you mentioned all these extra technologies that we didn't mention, the synergy of imaging and physiology, I think intravascular imaging-derived physiology is going to be an exciting topic of conversation over the next year, too, with, with a study called Fusion that's going to be coming out at some point in the near future. Great points. Thank you so much, Evan. Thanks. Our first case will be by Olga Toleva on coronary physiology. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I really like this new format, uh, but we uh, probably going to have to involve the audience a little bit more with uh, the first case, hopefully. Um, this case, um, I have no disclosures uh, associated with the case. Um, what I wanted to start with is the Occam's razor rule. And it's something that as the old school teaching of medical school where there's always a unifying uh, diagnosis to all the symptoms that the patient has. But nowadays, with all the complexity of our patients, the problems that we have, we realize that there is more of the opposite the Hickam's dictum, and it's basically our patients could have as many problems as they come with, and there could be as many explanations to them. With this, I'm going to present the case of uh, Anoka. This was a patient that was referred to me from a fellow who just graduated and went to practice in a different state. Uh, it was a 57-year-old female who had no prior cardiac history, um, was uh, overall healthy, and the only cardiac risk factor was that she was menopausal and had positive family history for coronary artery disease. Uh, she had very frequent episodes that started in March of 2023, and there was really no prodrome, no fevers, um, no real um, other issues related to stress. Eventually, uh, she had to uh, go for a stress test, which was ECG positive, so she had ST changes on the EKG, but the nuclear perfusion was normal and the ejection fraction was normal. She also had a normal echocardiogram, normal cardiac exam, and eventually ended up uh, being booked for a coronary angiogram and left heart catheterization. Um, 
these were uh, basically the images that were sent to me uh, from the fellows saying, uh, you know, I uh, did the angiogram, everything looks really good, I didn't see any major uh, obstruction, uh, except for maybe a little bit of a slow flow in the LED when I did the pictures. So I assume that we're dealing with um, angina with non-obstructive arteries and maybe microvascular dysfunction due to the slow flow. So I initiated um, medications that I thought may be helpful. He started with a beta blocker uh, and uh, nitroglycerin, which seemed to be helping at the time. Then added isosorbide. Then he called me and asked me what else could I do. I said maybe uh, change the beta blocker to nebivolol. Then she became hypotensive. And then ended up uh, then switching to diltiazem, long acting, uh, which also caused a lot of hypotension. During that period, she's been to the emergency room more than five times, and every time she had investigations, ECGs that were normal, and troponins that were negative. He called me again and said, at this point, I am at the end of my rope. I don't know what to do, I can't treat her, and she is constantly in pain. So she came in to my office, and I literally, while examining her, she looked really diaphoretic and unwell. I admitted her, and the next day we did a functional angiogram. We have held the medications that she was on for 48 hours, and this angiogram was performed uh, through a radial approach without a cocktail, six French. And as you could see here, even before engaging the right coronary, there was very severe spasm. Um, so this was not uh, catheter-induced. Um, the nitroglycerin helped with uh, some uh, dilatation of the artery, so at this point I already had in mind my diagnosis of coronary vasospasm. However, um, I decided to proceed with the full testing, so I uh, gave nitroglycerin, there was some dilatation of the vessel, I didn't see a slow flow, and then I did a denosine provocation with a coral flow measurement. As you could see here, she had very good response to adenosine with uh, basically normal coronary flow reserve and IMR, which excluded the possibility for her having microvascular disease. CFR was 3.7, IMR was 11, um, and she had no pain during the provocation. We then proceeded with the test dose of acetylcholine. In my lab, we used the one microgram intracoronary, and you could see that there is already quite visible spasm with the test, which is the picture on the left. And then a high dose is what we normally call uh, endothelial dose. In my lab, this is 50 micrograms over three minutes, and you could see that the artery completely shut down with extreme ST elevation and reproduction of her pain that she describes as severe, sharp, pressure-like sensation that makes her diaphoretic and gives her sensation of doom. I had a sensation of doom at this point, quickly gave nitroglycerin. Uh, luckily, the flow resolved spontaneously. I didn't have to go to a spasm dose of 100, so I had a clear diagnosis in my mind, and I, according to the Occam's razor rule, was very happy. I decided to admit her and titrate medications just to make sure she could tolerate what she couldn't in the past. So and Olga, great. can you mind, for people who don't do this routinely, you know, the terms IMR, CFR don't make much sense. So what are the numbers you look for? So you said 11 is the IMR. What is the number that would be abnormal and so how do you interpret that? Normally, uh, the IMR uh, is the um, uh, measurement of the microcirculation resistance. And uh, with the thermodilution method that we use here, um, a cutoff of 25, which is uh, a standard number, uh, is considered anything below 25 is normal, meaning that the microcirculation uh, is responding well to vasodilators or exercise, and anything above 25 is considered microvascular dysfunction. The coronary flow reserve cutoff usually uh, in the past was 2.5, but then, um, uh, in some papers, you may set, find a 2.0 as uh, anything less than 2.0 being abnormal, but uh, we have now agreed to 2.5. So in her case, uh, she responded really well to vasodilator, meaning that her microcirculation opens up uh, during stress with adenosine, which is a good sign uh, with good reactivity. 
the add steel choline provocation is an intracoronary infusion, and I'll show you the protocols that are available out there. Uh, but in general, uh, anyone that um, uh, responds to the test dose, we don't even have to proceed, but I really wanted to make sure that uh, she has Prince medals, and she did. And I felt very proud of myself. I started her on diltiazem, gave him dure, washed her overnight, and then when I came in the morning to discharge her, she had more pain. And then we realized that she actually had two types of pain. One was that constant pain that was making her very anxious, uh, and that seemed to be pleuritic. It was positional, it was getting worse on inspiration, which made me think that I should order a cardiac MRI. And when I did that, she actually ended up having pericarditis. So she had late enhancement of the pericardium. And I think what was happening was the pericarditis pain was triggering anxiety and a lot of stress and maybe adrenaline rush that was then triggering her vasospasm for which she was prone to. So I started her on anti-inflammatory therapy for pericarditis, and within the 24 hours subsequently while in the hospital, her pain actually dissolved quite a bit. And in follow-up, she was doing much better and able to tolerate the anti-anginal medications as well. So the key learning for me from this case was that the Occam's razor rule is not always true in medicine. There could be more than one explanation to the patient's symptoms. Um, and I believe that uh, pericarditis in this case was the first cause that triggered then the anxiety and the coronary vasospasms. And cardiac MRI could be a very helpful uh, way to uh, sometimes sort out complicated uh, patients who have more than one chest pain. So don't always think of spasm as the cause, but potentially there could be other issues. And uh, this uh, is the table that summarizes, it's quite busy, but uh, we just published it in um, cardiology review for people to um, use some uh, helpful tips and di uh, different dosages of uh, acetylcholine dilutions. And with this, I'm gonna stop and open for discussion. Thank you very much. Can you put back that slide so that we can stare at it for a while for anyone who has questions? Because some of us are just beginning to do this. Questions from the panel. Great talk, Olga. Um, when I was being trained at Emory, we used to do a lot of functional studies, and always, although we were like radialists, go femoral to avoid radial spasm, an issue with cocktail, as you mentioned. Looks like in your practice, you are doing them radial. Have you had any issues or anything to consider? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, I trained doing radial and then subsequently moved to Emory and converted to the femoral because this was the protocol. I didn't want to break the rules. But over the past year, I had gone back to what I used to do because um, I don't really encounter many issues with spasm without the cocktail. And um, especially now with the slender sheets and the silver way wire, it's very, very easy to go around. I probably had issues in about 1% to 2% of my cases when I had to convert to femoral, but overall the benefit of radial um, is, is very useful here. Plus we need six French for the thermodilution specifically. Question, Cal? Yes, uh, Olga, this is amazing um, presentation. And actually yesterday before I uh, got here, I was in discussion, no, the day before yesterday with my chief. I wanted to get the physiology in our lab. And, and um, it, we went about half an hour, he's trying, um, his argument was, okay, you diagnose it, what are you gonna do? So it's like, well, first of all, we need to teach the fellows, and second, you need to know the problem so you can actually induce research in the, uh, so we can actually find solution. So I just, um, my question to the panels, of course, uh, you, what argument would you make, or how would you answer this question? Like, what are you going to do? You're going to give the patient nitroglycerin anyway. Yeah, so here in this case, I think the learning point is, first of all, the fact that uh, there was more than one trigger. So really, thorough diagnosis gives you the opportunity to maybe push on certain therapies and back off on the others. Um, obviously, uh, she has been in the hospital several times 
after a normal angiogram with presumed microvascular disease just based on slow flow. So it just tells us that empiric therapy is not sufficient to really deal with these patients, and it's a huge burden to the system because of that. Yeah, I think it's a great point that Cal brings up, though. Getting this system in your lab, how do you justify it? I can say that for the guidelines, at least, it's now a 2A recommendation, so that's one thing that could use in your favor. Maybe Farouk has another idea. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Very, th those patients are very challenging just because most of the times, for some reason, their blood pressure is in the low side and they cannot tolerate medication or they're very intolerant. Uh, we did have a case similar to that, very challenging. So one option that uh, one may consider, and we used this lady, was sympathectomy. We did surgical sympathectomy and uh, miraculously that resolved the symptoms. Yeah, just to I, follow up on that, uh, there is a less invasive way, and which is a stellate ganglion ablation. I have done that to my patients too, so they start with just injection of lidocaine, and then if it works, then they go on to cryoablation. But the sympathectomy or VATS also works. Farouk? Um, so first, great presentation, and, and great job being a great doctor and listening to your patient to elicit two syndromes. That's the most important thing is to listen. Um, but the first thing, just to kind of broaden it, of course, you, you, you are a leader in this field, but you know, we have a randomized trial helping us understand how to use coronary physiology to distinguish between coronary microvascular dysfunction and coronary spasm. And Cal, they have two totally different pathways. If we diagnose spasm, we're going to stop beta blockers, focus on nitrates and calcium channel blockers. If we have coronary microvascular dysfunction, we're going to enhance beta blockers and avoid nitrates, and in the combination, use combinations. So just knowing that up front is super important for managing your patients. Everyone is afraid to stop a beta blocker in a patient who has refractory angina. When you make the diagnosis of spasm, it's really possible to do that. And so the you know, commendable, you, know, you have to have acetylcholine. It takes a little bit of time to have that get through pharmacy, and this is a kind of a national effort to figure out how to simplify this process and actually get a specific FDA approval for provocative testing. But short of that, um, you know, any, any of us who have programs are, are happy to help um, get people um, the kind of guidance to get that approved. But super important to have the coronary physiology done. Um, I just was I'm just curious um, for for you know there's a, some heterogeneity about how to do the procedure. And one of the things that I noticed is you had actually given nitroglycerin before you gave your acetylcholine, how often does that blunt the effects that you might see with acetylcholine and do you need to go to higher doses um, in general than you might without it? Uh, well, there has been a lot of back and forth about nitroglycerin before acetylcholine. Some protocols start with acetylcholine first and then they go on to adenosine testing. I uh, believe that within 10 minutes of the use of nitroglycerin, the effect is worn off, especially in a small dose. And as you saw here, when uh, I had spasm quite early on, even I didn't have to go to the spasm dose. I have never in my practice, more than 150 cases, uh, I have never had to give it 200 micrograms of acetylcholine. And the rate of spasm in my population is almost 80%. It is very, very common. So this is how I do it. And I don't think I've had any false negatives uh, with particularly IC nitroglycerin. The real important thing is holding calcium channel blockers before the procedure. These are the ones that could really mislead you and give you false negative results. But overall, uh, we're coming with a uh, white paper very soon. Hopefully, uh, uh, it's uh, under review now in Jack uh, through Microvascular Network. So, uh, we're hoping that we'll all unify these uh, steps of how we do the procedure. Great. I think we should probably move on. Thank you very much, Olga. Yeah. Yes, there is. And you show the angiogram of right coronary artery after you give nitroglycerin. The osteostenosis is still there. Yes, I didn't show all the pictures, but yeah, there was a bit of osteostenosis, which is finally resolved, and it was uh, a non-dominant right as well. Hi. Thank you. I guess I'll go next. Oh, I got it. Perfect. Good. So in five minutes, I'll take you on a different journey. Do we need an IVIS? Do we need OCT? Or do we need anything else? I think we need many, thing, uh, many other things uh, besides IVIS and OCT. Um, uh, I think dissatisfaction is the mother of innovation. 
If we accept the status quo to follow up on Evan's uh, presentation, on Olga's presentation, I think the time that we just believe um, an angiogram and move on with life, I think that these days are gone. Um, I work with senior partners. I learned a ton of things from them. Their clinical experience is definitely older than my age. Um, but I would still think innovation should be part of, of the cath lab, and we have to kind of um, uh, accept the fact that angiography is not enough anymore. So this is my tireless search for the culprit. When I was a fellow, I would do a case, I'll bring a patient to the lab on a Friday at 7 p.m., and my attending goes, is it real? Of course it's real. It's an end STEMI patient is on the table. We put the patient on the table, we do an angiogram, and the angiogram is normal, and everyone makes fun of you for the next week that this is an LVH that you brought to the cath lab. Is that true or false? I kept looking for the culprit, and I think I will find the culprit shortly. Here we go. These are my disclosures. I love physiology, I love imaging, I thrive by them. Uh, I think we should run them in the tap water like statins because I think they are gonna make a big difference in outcomes. 67-year-old man transfer with an NSTEMI. Here we go. I'm ready to make fun of the fellow. Um, hyperlipidemia, former tobacco use, and then uh, he, was, he had some chest pain, he went to a different hospital. He's a very uh, hardworking guy. He was uh, putting cabinets, um, and he said, uh, the, um, my 148th, bolt that I was putting on the wall, he, he needed 150. 148, he started having chest pain. So one of his coworkers told him, you know what, sit outside, uh, fresh breath of air, and take a cigarette. So that's what he did. Smoke a cigarette, um, didn't help, he went to the emergency room, um, and then they called this because he's, uh, it's, a, it's an emergency room that doesn't have cath capacity, so uh, he's in the lab. This is his EKG, we all agree it's beautiful. We still do EKGs before um, echocardiogram, which is a, a blessing. Um, and this is his troponin. I met him when the troponin was 900, uh, 9,600. This is high sensitivity troponin. So they watched him zero, high sensitivity at two, and then after that, while they're still um, uh, marinating him in the emergency room, they got a troponin and they said, you know what, it's time for the hospital center to take him. Um, they did an echo. This is an echo, believe it or not. It's my first echo this year that I could read. Um, and uh, here we go, uh, normal function to me. I picked some views. If anyone disagree, please let us know. Um, this is four chambers, two chambers, and tear wall is moving. Uh, questionable apex. Um, I can't see apex anymore. I just wait for the read. Refresh a couple of times on epic until we get a read. And then um, I felt it's normal. So I said, I'll bring the patient to the cath lab. I went radially. I use universal tiger catheter. And this is the first picture. See something, say something. Raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. Do you see any problem? We need more views. We need more views. We love angiography. We keep pushing contrast, looking for an answer. So I went a bit more caudal, a bit more cranial, yell at the fellow again, you know, you didn't go much caudal, lift the table, bring the eye up, and then let's take more pictures. And we're still taking pictures. Oh, there's something in the LAD, right? Of course there's something in the LAD. We all can see LAD. How many of you think this is obstructive? More than 50%? The trial says 50% and above is obstruction. Less than 50% is not obstruction. Syntax score counts by that. So, could be, could be plaque rupture, could be something else. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I totally agree. Something in the LED that kept, you know, hitting me on the back of my head. So I took another view. Uh, it's still the LED, but the circle looks good. Um, am I moving forward? Here we go. Took a picture of the RCA. Minimal luminal irregularities. Yeah, something in the mid-distal um, RCA, it's okay. Okay, question to you. This is LV gram. Any problems? Taketsubo? I'm thinking, I don't know. My ultraponin, normal angiogram, I'm waiting for the epical ballooning. Have you seen that before? Of course we've seen it. But it's a man, it's usually woman after surgery, after something else. But how come this guy is still, um, has normally F? There's something like a diverticulum or something in the uh, inferior wall. There's dropout in the inferior wall. Maybe, I don't know. And you have some, uh, uh, Down there, exactly. Okay. What do you want to do? Medical management, DAP, you have enough information. Yeah. This is ACS, DAP, and if DAP, for how long? And if he wants to go to knee replacement, would you stop the DAP? Questions I ask myself all the time. Is this something that I would recommend one year of DAP based on our guidelines and six months based on um, uh, European guidelines? Ready for DAP or no? Anyone ready? Raise your hand. And are active. I'm just like you. I'm learning. I didn't know. Do you do the no, wait, we're going to get there. You're ahead of the game. <laughs> Were you in the case with me, Doc? Doc, you're with me in the case. I could tell. 
Here we go. Is this myocarditis? Is this pericarditis? He was b putting bolts in cabinets. Is it musculoskeletal? Are you comfortable musculoskeletal? Well, the troponin, but I have every single thing negative. Um, I'm done. Olga told me this is my NOCA. They published this is my, this is my NOCA, myocardial infarction with no obstructive coronary arteries. Is this the, the story here? I don't know. I need more information. Who needs more information? We're in a conference. We'll need more information, of course. Okay, you need more information. Would you believe IVIS, OCT, or physiology in this case? Physiology, raise of hands. Who wants to do physiology? Two, three, okay. Who wants to do IVIS? Okay, high definition IVIS or low definition IVIS? 20 megahertz or 60 megahertz? Does that make a difference? 60 megahertz, 60 megahertz here. I'm like in an auction today. Okay, how about OCT? Okay. Many people OCT. So we know now the difference between imaging modality and physiology modalities. So I did IVIS, 60 megahertz, Boston Scientific. I couldn't see anything. I tried. I see good media. I could see good intima, good adventitia. The vessel looks almost like normal. Now what? Hi there. Did you try I'm to sorry. see if there is muscle bridge in this area? Is there muscle bridge in or this area? No. IVIS is clear. Like That's why I, I wish I could go back. But all IBIS, all these frames I took, they're exact same frames. Bridge is out. Bridge, my cardiac bridge, important. Okay, now what? MRI. <laughs> she raised her hand for physiology 10 seconds ago. Okay, here we go. OCT, I'm in the case. I, I have a guide, I have a wire, I wanted to understand what I'm looking at. So the same exact thing, but now I, when, in OCT, I do definitely see more medial plaque. Not crazy. Uh, distally, definitely a normal artery. A bit in the mid, right as I'm approaching the lesion, there is some fibro, um, lipidic, fibrocalcific um, plaque. But then at the spot, I see this. And I felt that there's something here, which is a calcified nodule protruding, and there is something right there too. So there's more plaque. So calcified nodule, we've seen calcified nodules before. We don't know how to treat them. We're trying to think IVL is the, 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 the treatment of choice because orbital atherectomy or rotational is not doing uh, us any favor. Um, so um, who believes this is the problem? Is that not more tikva? Is that more tikva? Exactly. It's a nodule with tikva. Here we go. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so no. So this is well-demarcated nodule pushing out. This is, you could, you could, say that this is an intimal rupture or disruption, I'm not sure, it's probably just a refraction of light with the, with the nodule. But I see more. You comfortable, dapt or no dapt? But I don't know what to do, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm asking. Have you seen these cases in your lab? And STEMI with normal NGO, now you have normal IVIS and somewhat abnormal OCT. So I called Olga, and Olga said, Olga said do physiology. So I'm using the same system, core flow, which will, it's a, a thermal dilution, it's a pressure wire, the wireless, from Abbott, and then all it does, it gives you something called a resting uh, non-hyperemic index, which is RFR, resting full cycle ratio. 0.89 below is abnormal, 0.92. This is down the LED, by the way. Borderline-ish. I called Lord Sattler, Lord said, you know what? I, this is non-hyperemic indexes you use, you need to induce hyperemia, use adenosine. I did. Here we go. FFR, 0.91. Who wants to stent? The fellows only wants to stent. They want to have 200 PCIs. But, but, but Haider, you shouldn't do stent. physiology in MI, right? In the culprit lesion? Uh -huh. Isn't that the contraindicated? Dr. Balakis now raised a point. Do you believe physiology in MI? I am not sure what I'm looking at still. I w definitely wouldn't take it for, uh, uh, like, in, with, like I'll take with this with, a, with a, uh, a, a, a lot of suspicion, but I'm doing it. I'm in, I'm doing it normal, physiologically normal. Do you think it was obstructive? Because I certainly didn't, okay. So here we go, CFR 1.5. If you cannot augment by two, you are in trouble. So this guy, the healthy guy, cabinets on a ladder, was, cannot augment. One point, I cannot augment because I'm lazy. But you saying Bolt, a guy working like this, should be able to augment the coronary flow to exercise or hyperemia. He gave you an, a CFR of 1.5, abnormal, and then he certainly gave you an IMR of 31, and if you correct that to the FFR, assuming FFR is one, to exclude everything, the machine is telling you that you still have an IMR of 32. Anything above 25 is bad. Anything above 40 on Bill Furon, 
uh, publication and post MI is definitely a problem. So this guy is up there. So he has microvascular problem. He cannot augment. What's the treatment? DAPT or no DAPT? Okay, plaque rupture. Is it Minoka or no Minoka? Okay, so Minoka, done? Done with the presentation? Okay. I did an MRI, because Olga said MRI, halfway through the presentation. So MRI told me, I don't know what MRI looks like, but this is MRI cinegram. Uh, the LV looks fine, but the inferior, the apical inferior wall, exactly to what the doctor said, there was a problem right there. And then when I asked my, my uh, friends to show me, because I'm blind, they said, here you go, we'll give you the ring. This ring right there, this is LGE, late gadolinium enhancement. There is enhancement of the entire endocardium. This is very specific, believe me. And if you don't, call cardiac MRI imager. This is MI until proven otherwise. This is something went down the LED, occluded it. Where did it come from? Most likely, as Dr. Kahl said, it's coming from, um, uh, came from a plaque rupture in that nodule through a clot. He's lucky we're done. So this is what I believe. My NOCA is work is a diagnosis in progress. I could not make the diagnosis early on because definitely cases like this, if the MRI is done and you don't see LGE, it might be Takotsubo, it might be myocarditis. With COVID, with COVID vaccines, there's a lot of, uh, we see more myocarditis than ever before. With immune check inhibitors for as chemotherapy or a treatment for cancer, you will definitely see more cases of Minoka, but I think it's a work, a diagnosis in progress an MRI might solve the problem for you. And this is what I see the future. I see the future, I was a fellow, chest pain, biomarkers, I bring to the lab, my attending says do a transthoracic, I do it on the table, we do coronary angiogram, we see nothing, I get yelled at, and then we're done. Now, I think we can do OCT, and I think OCT is better than IVIS, I hope you believe. In cases like this, when it's equivocal, even HD IVIS might not be able to show you, looking for the culprit, and after that, you should definitely move forward to see if there is any problem with the microvasculature, because certain cases, micro, microvascular dysfunction would be the problem in severe cases, or vasospasticity, um, and then you need to treat that. CMR within one week, and that's what we're testing in the HARP trial led by Harmony Reynolds of the NYU, and then you can get a diagnosis and you do a targeted therapy, and I discharge him on DAP, he has black rupture, I have more evidence, I gave him high intensity statin, and I released him back to work. And with that, I thank you all. Hi there. The doctor from Emory, he's gonna support Olga, and I'm gonna go down. Yes, sir. Why didn't you do a, a full, complete, functional evaluation? Because you, you, like, you, like, you, you saw this plaque rupture, you're super happy. It might be spasm, it might be microvascular dysfunction because these are caused as well. So I'm just wondering if some further investigation could have helped you maybe manage this patient beyond just that and maybe preventing further events. Sure, so you're asking for uh, acetylcholine challenge? Acetylcholine challenge yeah. and, and a full, did you do an IMR and CF? I did, did, IMR? I did IMR, CFR, RFR, and FFR because okay. it's readily available. I can do them ad hoc. Acetylcholine, I have to call the pharmacy. It's stable for two to three hours. We are trying to convince them that it's stable for a longer time, up to nine days, if you put it in the refrigerator. Um, there was shortage in acetylcholine eye drops in the country. Um, so there is a lot of limitations to get acetylcholine readily. This is an NSTEMI on the table, EBU35. I think the fact that I could get IMR and CFR to help me move the diagnosis forward, it's more readily available than using acetylcholine. And in, in full, I'm a 100% advocate of acetylcholine spasm testing and then um, uh, microvascular dysfunction with thermal dilution or Doppler wire. I agree with you, sir. Hi there. Would you bring him, I mean, we saw the first angiogram was they have been marinated for two days, as you said, in the ER. Would you argue that you should have stented that lesion that is with a thick fur and have a pure plaque rupture? Tough one. So uh, the question is, would you stented this? There is thick fur, a protruding nodule. With a, an, with a lumen that big, I don't know if my stent will do anything else. Now, there's an argument between preventative cardiologists and plumbers like myself. I would like to put a stent in everyone. Uh, and I always, you know, I, with this chemia trial even, I don't want to sound like I'm a non-scientific and I'm not data-driven, 
But it's, if it's my LED and it's 80% and I'm a hiker and a biker and I'm in Denver, Colorado for the next CVI, for example, I don't want to drop dead in a, on, a, on a trail and by the time ambulance comes to me, I'm already cooked. Um, it's hard to argue, but for this, this lesion, it's hard for me to put a 6 or stent unless I do an iliac bioband stent in that LED. It's open. Yeah. I'm sorry. A few comments on that. Yeah. So first, Stefan is a super tough judge. Boy, I thought you did. 99%, like you're in the upper 1% of what would be done for a non-STEMI in this country just for an evaluation. So that was fantastic. Well, thank you, sir. Um, the, you know, there are a couple things about the diagnosis. I'm just curious more, more that two or three things. But one is, is that there's no thrombus on the OCT. So you can look at erosion, you can look at rupture, but there is no thrombus there. So it's still an association of this possible, you know, kind of tikva that's non-occlusive and that source of embolism. Another possible source is the ectasia flanking it and having an emboli form in that environment. So both are there. The, the, the question I'm wondering is, is the actual CMR shows that the infarct is on the inferior side of the apex. And I just was sure, did you think the LED wrapped around all the way to make sure that it was all the way there? Yes. Because, um, um, you know, that would obviously have to match the MR. It's very unusual to have no EKG changes with a transmural infarct in the LAD. So it's, it is also a little bit of an irregularity and, and surprising that way. But I would say the, outside of this, I think DAP, if you see coronary disease, DAP for 6 to 12 months is totally reasonable, even if you don't know. The two studies that Harmony Reynolds that you referred to that really get to the heart of this are OCT and CMR, and those should really be kind of the primary modalities that are used. Definitely open to how, understanding how physiology acutely makes a difference. As Mono suggested, you're going to get some false negatives because microvasculature is kind of temporarily impaired, and we don't know what the steady state situation is. True. Yeah, so, so the LED is a wraparound the apex LED. Um, just like one last I comment, if you don't mind, Dr. Tam. It's going on. Going on. It's, it's going all the way. You might, you might say that the whale tail at the LED, I think one of the fins of that whale was dropped. You can hallucinate that there is nothing there. Maybe that's what explained the MRI. The microvascular, the MVO that I demonstrated with IMR and CFR, it's most likely from, as you said, the thrombus that flew all the way down, um, resolved. It's like there's, there's a concept in Europe which we don't use much is the, the transient STEMI. Uh, it's a STEMI, you come to the lab and there's nothing. Uh, is it spasm? Is it micro uh, emboli? I'm not sure, but this guy had an embolus that went down. Yeah, I, I just want to add something to it uh, about the safety of using acetylcholine in Minoka. Uh, there's been question about it, and there is Italian group that's running a study now in the acute setting like you do. But there's been lots of uh, observational data for up to after 48 hours. I think in this case, maybe it's worthwhile thinking about bringing the patient back after four weeks and redoing the full functional study where you would reevaluate the microcirculation and see if it's actually improved and do a spasm provocation, which could probably explain better why he had such an extensive MI. True. Last comments. We, need, we really need to move on. Dr. Tamas Holland. Okay. She, oh. she, a question in the audience? Yeah, no, I was going to say sort of similarly, congratulations, because nobody would do that type of workup. But I probably would have stopped at the, when you saw the plaque and the thin cap fibroatheroma, treated with DAPT, not stented. And then you could, like Olga said, go back a month later if you really wanted to know if there was perhaps spasm as well. But I think you have your diagnosis. And you know the rise and fall, the size of the enzymes, along with the MRI, clearly suggests an infarct. And most likely, it was either spasm or plaque rupture. So 100 percent DAPT and then doing the provocation. 100%. I, I, I did the physiology because Dr. Laswood mentioned this early with his comment that it's, it's I work with fellows and I, I'd love to show them all the things. And, I, and if I'm advocating this for the future, I'd like to kind of test it in certain cases. I do believe that the day would come that you would do an imaging and probably a, an angio derived IMR or CFR will be the answer to minimize things. I took enough pictures already. I took multiple orthogonal views, so I think it's enough for an angiogram-derived uh, physiology assessment may be the answer. Or an OCT-derived physiology assessment would be the answer here, too. Um, but totally agree. I don't do this in every case, believe me. Um, I have 10 cases a day. I want to move through the day. I want to go see the kids' baseball games and stuff. But um, in certain cases, when I was really struggled with the answer, uh, I think it's useful to have a comprehensive work. Great. Thank you very much for that case and well presented. And with this, I'd like to invite the next presenter. Uh, it's Dr. Farshad Farouzadeh, and he is going to uh, present on coronary imaging. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, it was a great presentation. I heard actually Haders talk before, so I should have paid more attention to the schedule and make sure that I'm not following him. Uh, well caffeinated, uh, strong presentation. Um, in our actually uh, center, I mean, we don't have functional study yet fully, but definitely we would do cardiac MRI in the patient like this. You can't just let the patient go. Uh, you know, there's no obstructive disease, and, and we, we find all sorts of infiltrative disease, a little bit of infarction that really changes management. So um, cardiac MRI would be something we would do. And uh, the good news about my actually case, and to make it interesting for you to follow me, is that at least I think a third of the group is going to have a similar case to this one Monday when you go back to your cat lab fresh out of CVI. And I hope going through this case uh, helped you kind of uh, think about this case and how would you do. So this is a 58-year-old gentleman, typical diabetes, you know, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, a smoker, epigastric pain initially came to ED, and he had a non-STEMI, you know, troponin peaked at about 2,500, EKG, as you see, uh, pretty normal. We do also do EKGs, and uh, we do also an echo. So EF 45 to 50, uh, A1C, you know, was a little bit high, so not really optimized. And these are his pictures. Um, so, of course, we go radial, you know, you look at the caudal view, there's something in distal left main going to LAD. Um, there's that ramus branch up there. Uh, there's some overlap, but you see there's some disease there. And the proximal of the LAD itself, very long, actually, lesion, not quite as actually nice and clean as you like it. So there's definitely some disease in the left system. If I can advance, um, these are the cranial actually views. Um, I mean, LAD probably not too, too bad in this view, but again, uh, we are doing, you know, a 2D actually angiogram trying to figure out what's going on. And of course, this is, is uh, RCA, uh, which obviously with his non STEMI, uh, I think everybody agrees in the room that this is his culprit lesion. So that's it. I mean, we took the pictures, we know the anatomy blueprint. What would you do? So, uh, how to interpret this? Um, you know, you are in a coronary physiology imaging actually uh, session, and you are dealing with some multivessel looking disease, distal left main, um, and 50% more. I mean, somebody can call it 50% and uh, distal left main, high syntax score. Patient has diabetes. Uh, let them um, have the surgeon take care of this. The bypass is a younger individual, long term benefit, freedom trial. All those, you know, come to your mind. Maybe that's the right patient to do that. Or no, I mean, not too bad. They have a left uh, side disease, single vessel, take care of the RCA, go to your baseball, or do whatever else you need to do, go to the next case, and just fix the RCA and come out. Um, and the RCA is almost 100% occluded at this point, and uh, would you do just PCI uh, or medical therapy and you know, not do the PCI at this point, uh, see how the patient does, or I guess you need more data, and that's why you're sitting in this room. Anybody actually has any idea? Anybody goes for any choice other than need more data? No? Everybody agrees, need more data? Okay, we'll give you more data. Physiology, imaging, which one? And um, any suggestion at this point before I go any further? PCI of the right. So left system disease is not significant. Left system disease is not significant. No? Okay. Anybody else? I was just going to comment that uh, I would want to put a wire down, a pressure wire down the LED, but it's very tortuous, and this might be a good situation to use angiographic-based FFR, uh, despite some of the limitations we've talked about. Uh, I'll just also add that I feel with angiographic FFR, there's some data that suggests that it is more ideal when the vessel is obtaining a lot um, of myocardium. A lot of times we don't get as good diagnostic accuracy with the circumflex or the RCA. I mean, it's a great comment. Unfortunately, in our center, we still don't have angiographic uh, FFR, but uh, you're right. There are some vessels that, because of tutorials, you want to avoid wiring, uh, but we don't have that in our hand. So, you know, I really wanted to make sure his left main disease, again, with diabetes and all the risk factors he has, to make sure it is not a significant distal left main disease and uh, with the overlap and proximal LAD long lesion because if it's really significant in left main and with all the you know, uh, situation that is going on with this risk factor and all, and his age, 
uh, it should be uh, you know, a case that would, uh, we would consider. So as you probably can see in the image, uh, I use the JL catheter just to make sure that uh, I equalize actually in the aorta uh, so that I can you know, disengage equalize in the aorta. So if you do coronary physiology, you want to do it really right. Yeah? You want to make sure the patient has got nitro. You are not really measuring a spasm. You are measuring epicardial disease. Uh, so disengage, equalize in aorta, I4 of the ramus, which is across the distal left main. And RFR, I4, I mean, two different companies. So, uh, but the cutoff is the same, 0.89. And uh, it was negative, 0.96. So we're done, huh? No significant left main disease. Move on. Fix the right. Yes, no? Sorry. You're worried about the left main. How about an IVUS? Got a wire down. So you really want to look at minimal cross-sectional area there. Exactly. I mean, that, that, that's a very good thought. Uh, but since we had the RFR, IFR wire down there, uh, I just swapped it to LAD at this point just to get more information from the LAD, um, you know, just to see how this goes. And I was hoping I'm going to get a nice negative RFR from the LAD and be done, huh? And this is the RFR, 0.89, which uh, by definition is positive. So 0.89 or lower is positive. So I see Arnold wants to give a... <laughs> yeah, um, in the interest of time, we could probably move forward. But I mean, ultimately, the RFR is borderline, and you probably want to see where the, the lesion is, if it's left main or not. You could just be gradual disease throughout the whole torturous LAD, or perhaps some induced wire uh, straightening. Great. So at this point, actually, we gave IV adenosine to do the FFR. That's what we do always when we have a borderline RFR to make sure it is real. And uh, as you mentioned, it is significant or not. And FFR of the LAD came back 0.82, uh, which is in the negative range. Now, actually, knowing that the left main system is not uh, obstructive, is not physiologically relevant to this case, we moved on with uh, uh, fixing the right, which is just a regular angioplasty. You know, um, just wiring, making sure the wire is in the right position, two different angles, lots of ballooning, ascending from distal, coming back all the way to proximal, and uh, eventually needed to cover the osseum as well. Make sure to go to the cranial view so we see the osseum of the right well to get it done. And at this point, you know, we are probably about 19 minutes into the case, uh, doing everything. But again, just to make sure that for this patient, what I'm really looking at is to get a nice result uh, with longevity. So we want to do some sort of intravascular imaging uh, to make sure that we have good stent expansion all through these uh, three stents I had to place into fix this RCA, which happened to be much bigger actually um, when you know, we extended it, it was under field. And uh, after that, uh, there was an area in the distal section that we did some optimization with balloon. And, uh, and that's the final result. And uh, so we really didn't take any shortcut in this case. So I think the really uh, issue is, um, as it was mentioned, uh, between the RFR and uh, uh, FFR, there's about 15 to 20 percent published by one of the panels, Dr. Sito and Dr. Kern. Uh, that there's about 15 to 20 percent discordance. And why is that uh, be, uh, be, uh, based on this uh, Poise uh, equation is uh, the difference between diffuse disease and focal disease. So RFR tends to call positive the focal disease and IFR the diffuse disease. And uh, so we, you want to separate those things uh, from each other and make sure what you're measuring is true. So if there's any borderline um, RFR, we always actually go ahead and do the FFR to make sure what we are measuring is actually correct. So the other actually um, message is really when in doubt, use coronary physiology and imaging really tr low threshold. So what I would do and uh, tell always uh, one of the final messages late in June when we have graduating fellows, uh, I make sure I tell them is when you are going to your practice the first uh, you know, couple of years at least, your intravascular imaging use even pre and post should be top 70, 80 percent. Maybe we can all argue all day if that needs to remain more than that uh, when you are like five, 10 years into practice or not. I think there's going to be difference in opinion. Uh, but definitely early on, calling the sizes correctly and making sure you get the optimal result with intravascular imaging for almost any PCI is really mandatory. And of course, uh, if you don't want to get any regret, just look at the patient in, who is in front of you and what is right for that patient and no shortcut. So if physiology is the right thing to do, go ahead and do it. If vascular imaging is the right thing to do, go ahead and do it. And if both, um, just do that. And there are patients that, uh, again, 
you may not need all these uh, modalities to be used. So by that, I think I'm right on time to finish and open up to these um, discussions. Thank you, Farshad. We just one comment. I was just going to mention that I feel sometimes wary of doing uh, IFR, FFR on the non-culprit vessel in the setting of an MI because of the fact that FFR is often underestimated because of the microvascular dysfunction, and IFR is um, sometimes overestimated. And it seems like, actually, in this situation, you see that where the IFR is borderline um, positive, where the FFR is not. Exactly. That should be kept in mind uh, if you have a culprit lesion right there, yeah. All right. In the interest of time, we'll move on to our next presenter. Thank you, Farshad. Good job. Uh, our next presenter is Debraj. Debraj Das. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, so my case is uh, going to be a little bit more imaging focused. Uh, I'll, although I love physiology, uh, I do want to uh, get the opinion of the imaging experts in the room. So we'll get that. Presentation right before lunch is always the hardest, so just bear with me. Olga, any other comments while we're waiting for the slides to come up? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to congratulate uh, um, <clears throat> the fact that uh, you've used both imaging and physiology, but one additional thing that I think would have been very interesting in your case is a post-PCI physiology, which is something that a lot of us don't like to do or are scared to do just because then you start kind of chasing yourself around what else could I optimize. Uh, just a provocative additional thing that I think helps a lot um, when we already have a, an FFR wire open. Olga, I think a really good comment. And I think that's the um, um, very thing that's being tested in trials such as defined GPS. And so I think it'll lead to very interesting results. And especially in the situation of diffuse disease, like the one we have here, uh, identifying step-ups, which is something we can act on, versus diffuse disease with this gradual uh, pullback, which uh, usually carries worse prognosis and is much harder to treat, and obviously it'd be more medical management. Debraj? All right. Thank you. So uh, my name is Debraj Das. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists from what we call the Texas of the North, which is uh, uh, Alberta. And I have an interesting case uh, that hopefully will be enlightening to everybody. So I'll start with just an angiogram, just because we're all experts and uh, in the room. So I'll let that play just for a couple of minutes, and I'll, uh, you know, have a thought of what your diagnosis would be. And just to get the audience a little bit more involved. Uh, so based off of that angiogram, how many people, just by a show of hands, would call that coronary artery disease or an ACS? Okay, nobody. Um, an embolic phenomenon or a hypercoagulable state, similar to Hader's case. Anybody? Takers? Not really. Coronary vasospasm? Nope. And what about SCAD? We've got a few more hands up in the air, maybe. Okay. Or, you know, we have a new fellow starting, so maybe it was an air embolus. Okay, so a few options, not really sure. Um, so I won't give you the context of when that angiogram was done, but I'll give you the case. So that case starts with a 33-year-old female, and she comes in to the eMERGE. She's, uh, you know, she's a marathon runner. She had a 10-kilometer run earlier in the day. She's prepping for her, um, uh, uh, a race. She comes in at about 11 o'clock to the eMERGE and had stuttering chest pain for about three or four hours. She was ultimately triaged. She has no cardiac history, she's a non-smoker, and has absolutely no history of premature CAD or sudden cardiac death. That's her presenting ECG. Any thoughts from the panelists? Anything exciting there? Yes or no? Early repoll. 33, remember, 33-year-old, 33 middle of the night, you're the interventional cardiologist, they're calling you with that ECG. Are you activating the cath lab? It looks like Let's hyperacute T's there. Sorry? Hyperacute T's. Okay. So you have, no, you have no previous ECG to compare to. And again, don't, don't bias yourself from the angiogram, because I'm not telling you the context of when that was done. But at the time when we looked at this, we thought early repoll, she's an active person. 
uh, didn't really think too much of it at the time, said maybe get some blood work, we'll see where it goes. So blood work comes back, so BNP, D-dimer, CBC, X-ray, all is normal. Her troponin comes back at 26, this is high sensitivity, and a normal is less than 20, okay? She's kind of settled down, she's gotten to sleep, they've given her some morphine. And this is really what we were thinking, well, is this an ACS or is this kind of early repoll? And again, in the middle of the night, what's the plan? Are we activating the cath lab or are you gonna say, well, maybe a stress test, a perfusion study, and she's at a peripheral site, so maybe that'll take about a day. Uh, a CT coronary angiogram, a dibutamine stress echo, a cardiac PET, or would everybody in the room just take her directly for an angiogram? Any thoughts from the panelists? Someone here said bedside echo to help you with well motion abnormality acutely. Okay, peripheral site, rural, rural center, as you know, so nobody's really comfortable enough to say anything from a bedside. But they probably do have a repeat ECG available to them. And you the would, disconnect between the size of those anterior T waves and her R waves is really striking. Those T waves are huge okay. compared to her R waves. Okay. Uh, so there was not a repeat ECG done. Um, I agree. We had uh, asked for that. But by the time we had connected later in the morning and we were involved again, uh, we thought just for the sake of kind of moving things through the day, let's just bring her for an angiogram at some point that morning, okay? So we ultimately opted for an invasive angiogram in a 33-year-old female, rightly or wrongly. Um, so this is what her right coronary looks like, grossly unobstructed. An REO projection, really nothing. A caudal view, you know, less of a big circumflex system, a big OM, really nothing there. And then we're seeing that. So 33-year-old female, again, active marathon runner, what's your diagnosis? Is this, say, again, plaque rupture? Is this SCAD? Yes, or embolism. Or embolism. So the, the reality is, is we really don't know what this is, right? So I'm looking at this in my cath lab. Yes, there's maybe some little bit of plaque. I'm a little bit biased because that's not a completely normal mid-vessel. The diagonal, that's still patent has a little bit of atherosclerosis. But again, the point here is you don't have a diagnosis. I don't know really what to manage here. All I know is I need to get some flow back to the vessel. And that's what we did. Uh, relatively straightforward to wire. I used a workhorse BMW wire. But my next thought was without a doubt, we need to pull an imaging catheter. And although we had flow, that mid-vessel looks hazy. Again, the diagnosis is really unclear. I'm not really sure this is SCAD. That's kind of what I'm thinking. And so this is what the OCT shows, and I'll kind of leave this for some of the imaging guys to maybe give us their thoughts before I tell you kind of what I was thinking. Did you have an LV gram? I did not do an LV gram. No. I did not have an echo at that time. She came directly from the peripheral site to the cath lab. And would an echo have changed what you were going to do? So presumably she would have had an anterior wall motion abnormality. So imaging people in the room, thoughts? So you've already angioplasty, so it's, you know, there's going to be some modification of the culprit lesion, right? Yep. 2 balloon, right. pre-dill, OCT. Yeah, there's clearly a, a severe lesion. You can freeze it on that frame if possible. We can all look at it more uh -huh. precisely. And, and of course, you have the ability we, to magnify it on the system. Just right in that midsection, yep. kind of right, right there. Right in there. So you see some remnants of possible um, surface thrombus on, on that, suggesting it is an active lesion. I'd look more carefully to see if there was actually um, plaque rupture versus an intact fibrous cap, which would tell you erosion. Uh, but I think there might be the element of, um, of rupture there. I have to look at it more, more carefully. But this is clearly the culprit lesion, and I imagine you know, if we had had all the imaging tools and biomarkers and EKGs that we would see that this is probably a, a sizable uh, infarct that's happened and the next biomarkers are going to be very high. Absolutely. The main point of this, though, was that the OCT confirmed to me that this was fibrous and lipidic plaque. This was not SCAT. And at in a 33-year-old patient, again, you know, you're, you're wondering, is this, you know, you're putting a stent into somebody at that age, you really want to be confident of what your diagnosis is. 
antiplatelet management, lipid management, but there was no doubt that when I was looking at this that that was my interpretation, was that there was diffuse fibrous and lipidic plaque. I actually didn't feel like there was a clear rupture uh, when I was looking at it in more detail. There may have been something there, but I thought the cap was a bit more thick. Uh, there was, I thought, more white thrombus, cholesterol uh, crystals, and uh, I thought it was maybe more consistent with a plaque erosion uh, in terms of diagnosis. Uh, there was no intramural hematoma. There was no obvious dissection plane. There was a small burden of calcium, um, but that was kind of how I interpreted it. The initial plan was to actually just focally stent uh, with a 3 by 28 Zion stent, but uh, I think I probably deployed it at too high of a pressure and then angiographically had a proximal and distal edge dissection, um, so ended up putting more metal than I was hoping to in this, in this young patient. Um, and this is kind of what the OCT shows after, which uh, you know, shows a well-expanded stent um, with uh, you know, no edge dissection, thankfully, this time. and. Uh, um, uh, you know, well, well uh, a post stent all throughout. So nothing too exciting on the post OCT there. But this is kind of what our fi uh, final angio looks like after ample boluses of nitro. And I think if we were able to stick a OCT catheter down to the mid to apical LAD, I'm sure you would see diffuse uh, lipidic plaque present throughout. But uh, this is what our echo showed shortly after. So her EF was fortunately preserved, but she had a clear wall motion abnormality and a dilated ventricle, there was no thrombus. And uh, ultimately, the point of this case was really the importance of pulling that imaging catheter for a diagnosis. This would have gone a completely different trajectory if there was clear evidence of a dissection and uh, there was evidence of SCAD, um, you know, in terms of whether or not she needed a stent once we had a Timmy 3 flow. I thought the diagnosis was most consistent with plaque erosion, and I know there's more and more data saying that if there's evidence of plaque erosion, which is identified on OCT, if the luminal uh, stenosis is less than 70, arguably she may not have even needed a stent. I don't think anybody would disagree that at the tightest spot on that OCT, it was severely uh, narrowed, and uh, at a minimum we were you know, hoping to do one focal stent, but uh, again, just in terms of pathophysiological mechanisms, so plaque erosion remains on that differential. It's usually younger patients who are premenopausal, uh, lack the traditional risk factors for coronary disease, uh, and they lack multivessel disease. They are less likely to have TICFA and all those kinds of parameters. Her follow-up lab, so this is the fo uh, next day in our CCU, ended up showing an extremely high LDL. So in our Canadian um, parameters, that's greater than five, which I think translates to 200 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, and she was li lipoprotein A positive. So we ended up giving her dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months and then ultimately the plan will be, this was just uh, six weeks or so ago, will be to continue on P2Y12 uh, monotherapy, a lipid target initially of less than 1.8 or less than 70 uh, milligrams per deciliter. <coughs> we started her right up front on statin and azetamibe and then now we have access to uh, inclycerin uh, more and more at our site. So we have a relatively low threshold that if people are not meeting their lipid targets uh, within about three months or so, we start people on inclycerin very early. All right, and with that, I'll end. Thank you. All right, thank you for that case. For those of us who are runners, it's, it's scary to think that it's not enough to run and run marathons to overcome uh, high LDLs. So that's a warning to all of us, Freshad. Uh, any last comments before we all go to lunch? Great case, Debrej. Um, I just wanted to uh, emphasize again the importance of uh, checking lipids with LP little a and also ApoB, as these are clearly uh, significant risk factors that we may uh, underestimate or miss in our regular day. Absolutely. All right. Thank you all for your attention. There are two satellite symposia going on. The